Poch and I, who have worked together, he's in Arizona, I'm in New York City. So you have two very different universities, both big, both world famous. He has a better football team. We have no football team, but we do have the Big Apple. So uh, I want to start out first with a question, though, to find out what you think. So in the United States, we have what are called public universities, Arizona State, private universities, New York University. Which are better? Public universities, hands in the air. Private universities, hands in the air. That means most of you say they're the same or you don't know. So let's find that out. Who thinks public and private are just as good? Three. Who don't know the difference? Ah, all right. Well, there are a lot of differences in what they cost. There are not always a lot of differences in how good they are. If you look at the top 50 universities in the United States, you'd find as many private as public. So in many ways, they're the same. How many of you think that Berkeley is a private university? How many of you think Berkeley is a public university? And many of them don't know the difference. Right. Berkeley <laughs> happens to be a public university. Right. How many of you think Stanford is a public university? How many of you think it's a private university? That's good. How many of, think, how many of you think that Stanford and Berkeley are so different between one another in terms of quality? How many of you think that Stanford and Berkeley are about the same? How many of you are going to engineering? Berkeley is higher ranked than Stanford, by the way. So just to put this in perspective, I think what Jerry was trying to say is that public and private universities, both, the, both of them, are world-class universities or not so world-class universities. And this goes to the previous panel's point that was made by Bennett. Research the universities that you want to go to. That's the first thing that you can do for yourself in order to get to the university that you want to be at. So let's talk a little bit about geography. So uh, I assume everyone here thinks they want to go to an international university. Is that fair? Not in India? Who? So who wants to go to a university in the United States? University in uh, the United Kingdom? Europe? Okay. How about uh, China? Singapore? Australia? The Middle East. Right, so we have a picture of geography which looks like mainly the United States, the United Kingdom, Singapore, and then others. And you heard Harjiv talking about the interest Japan has, the interest that China has. Many countries now want to have a global quality and they want students from around the world. So you bring a premium, which is you come from a great nation, a part of the world which is unique, and you bring something that in many places, like in the United States, they're eager to see you bringing some new ideas, a new culture to what's going on. So let's talk a little bit, yes. Ponch, about what is it like to go to Arizona State? I mean, actually my son graduated from Arizona State, and he picked it for two reasons. You'll love this. One is, at the time he went, they did not have to write an essay to get admitted. And his criteria for college was no essay. Not two, anymore. And then, see, quality's gone up. <laughs> Second, uh, he wanted to be in the sun. He wanted good weather. They still so have a lot of it. Sun's still there. Good. Yep. So there's two things about Arizona State we already know. But tell us about Arizona State. So let's start with the sun piece. Um, Arizona is a very, very warm place. The weather in Arizona is probably very similar to Delhi, probably even warmer than Delhi in wintertime, about the same in summertime. So you will see that you are no different than where you are here. So let's start with that. So most people come to Arizona because the weather is fantastic, okay, for visits. Let's talk about Arizona State University because it's a public university. Let's talk about this. How many of you have heard of the academic ranking of world universities? There's a lot of press about that these days. And the press is also about the fact there is no Indian university in that list, in the top 300 of them. Right? Yes. How many of you guess that 
Arizona State University is in the top 300. Okay, that's not bad. How many of you think we are in the top 200? That's not bad. How many of you think that we are in the top 100? It turns out that we are ranked 79th in the world. So this is something that, that unless you do your research on universities, you will not figure this out. It also turns out that Arizona State University was not in the academic ranking of the world universities about 10 years ago, in the top 100 or 200, but is the only university that has moved into the top 100 since the ranking started and climbing fast. Okay? I'm not trying to make the case for you to come to Arizona State University as much as I would love you to do that, but I'm not trying to make that case. The case that I'm trying to make is that unless you do your research right, you may not necessarily have all your facts straight. This includes your parents, by the way, and your counselors sometimes. So it's very important to pay attention to that. The next thing that I wanted to start, ask all of you a question. How many of you want to be innovative? How many of you want to be creative? How many of you want to have a job? It turns out that the Wall Street Journal did a survey of all the employers hiring graduates from all the public and private universities. And Arizona State University was ranked fifth in the country. Fulbright scholars. Arizona State University tied last year with Yale and Berkeley. This year we surpassed them. We are ranked third in the country. Again, the case that I'm making by these data points is do your research, okay? So now going to what Arizona State University is like that, what, what, is, what Arizona State University is like, we are a very interdisciplinary friendly university, meaning you might come into engineering and after a year you may say, I don't like engineering. Or you may say, I don't like mechanical engineering. Or you may say, I don't like any science or technology engineering at all. It could be any of the above, but in order for you to move from one discipline to another discipline, it is a seamless way of doing those kinds of things because ASU encourages students to be creative, innovative, be there to test out what works for them, what does not work for them, and then be successful in what they are supposed to be successful at, rather than a preconceived notion at the age of 16 or 17 that you are, that you know what you want to do with your career. Most so the top class, the, I saw a lot of Ivy League universities folks that you raise your hands. Not that it can't be done, it's a lot more difficult to do those things, to move from one to the other, or even go from arts to engineering. It's something that you can seamlessly do, or combine arts and engineering in your, you know, in your program. Do dual degrees, do minors and majors. These are things that you can do in a public university like Arizona State University seamlessly. So uh, I, I went to Ohio State University as an undergraduate. I went to Yale to go to law school. So I have both a life in a public university, Ohio State, and a private university, Yale. And uh, you'd heard Harjiv talking about his education, New York uh, Institute of Technology, and then Columbia. Think about this. Your graduate school, in many ways, will give you the most credential in your life not your undergraduate school. So while you can shoot for Harvard and Yale and Stanford as your undergraduate school, and if you get there, great, take it. But if you don't, you have great opportunity. Do well, whether you're at Arizona State, whether you're at Ohio State, Iowa State, Connecticut State, and then hit a graduate school that really marks you as special. Make that a goal, because graduate school will define you. That's correct. So, so that's a picture of public and private. You can mix and match, and it can be quite exciting. So let's talk about the NYU, New York University. So first, we are in the Big Apple, but we're more and more a global university. So if you go to New York University now, you can enter in three major campuses. One is in New York City. Two is in Abu Dhabi. I want to talk a little more about that. And three is in Shanghai. And you can enter in any of these three campuses, and you get the same degree, and you get the same education, maybe with more of a Chinese flavor in Shanghai, more of a Middle Eastern culture in Abu Dhabi, a little more of the Big Apple in New York City. That's one. Two, 
we're expecting every undergraduate to study at least one semester someplace else than where they entered. So if you enter in China, you need to be in New York City or Buenos Aires or Paris or Prague. If you enter New York City, you need to get out of the Big Apple at least one semester. We want to educate a young person to be, the words we use are cosmopolitan, a person who knows the world. And we often have a way we talk to our students, which is if you want to be with people just like you, that look like you and talk like you and have lived lives like you, don't, do not come to New York University. Because at New York University, you're going to meet the other, someone who is different than you, someone who has lived a different life, maybe rich, and you're not. Maybe you're rich, and she's not. But you're going to have an experience with how to live with the other. Because where our view of the world is, your life and your careers are going to be not just in India, but in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in New York City, in London, in Paris, in Nairobi. And you're going to have to learn to live with others who have different values, different cultures, different styles. And we teach our students to, to sort of love the fact that someone different is beside me, and I'm learning from that difference. So, so first this is an excellent point. I know I, I made this point a few years ago in one panel that I was in in here, in Delhi. If you're going to come to the United States, and all that you're worrying about is how many of my classmates are also coming to the same university, and how I can room with them, and how I can eat the same food and watch the same movies, the Hindi movies and the Bollywood movies, how I can hang out in the Indian associations there, and just pretend that you are at NYU or ASU, you may as well not come. It is not about the degree that you get from a university. You could get it anywhere. But it is about the experience that you experience. It is about this, the global awareness. It's about the different kind of cultures and other things that you encounter. And what it makes you than what you are today. That's an exceedingly important thing. If you care about these things, then going abroad makes sense. Otherwise, you could have as well gotten that education here, or maybe in the Virginia Polytechnic campus down in Chennai. You could do your undergraduate degree there. You would get the same degree, but without all of those experiences. And that's the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself and the investments that you make in your academic pursuit. So the second big difference about New York University, and I think in some ways this is about education in general, is that Let's say in the 20th century, the century that Ponch and I got educated, a good bit of the university's view was, I'm going to fill you full of facts and data, and you're going to memorize it, you're going to learn it, and you're then going to use it for your career. But today, we all know the facts are on the internet. Wikipedia can tell you the answer to almost any question you've got. So more and more, what we're going to teach you are skills related to how you learn about learning, how you learn more, how you tap into this enormous amount of information on the web and in life, and then use it for creative and innovative purposes. So Ponch asked the question, how many of you wanted to be creative and innovative and he followed with and have a job? Because almost every employer is looking for, are you a creative person? Are you an innovative person? Do you add value to what I'm doing? Because if you're just a robot doing the same old thing, I'll hire a robot. Or I'll hire a person that's not that bright and is a lot cheaper. But if you want to have a great job, you come and add value. Boss, I got an idea you've never thought of. And it's going to make you rich. Or it's going to make the world change. So more and more, we're saying get out into the world, study abroad. And two, learn to be a creative, innovative, risk-taking, inquisitive, critical thinking person. Yes. And so NYU often says that we try to educate you to be a T person. So you're smart, this is the vertical part of the T, in a special area. I'm a mechanical engineer. I'm a political scientist. I'm a business student. You're smart in an area. But the horizontal part is I can think innovatively. I'm a critical thinker. I'm tolerant of others. I know about the world. I've traveled. Interestingly, 
for the first 15 years in your life, this is the place you make your money. You get hired to write ad copy for a market, an ad agency because you're a great writer. But about the time you turn 40, life changes. And it's the question, can you lead? Can you manage? Can you imagine the future and build a company that moves into the future? And those skills are unrelated to the T, the vertical part. They're entirely related to this. So we're trying to give you both at once. So chances are, if you look at your parents or your grandparents, they probably had one or two jobs yeah. in their life, Question. in their entire lifetime. They started to work for IBM, they still work for IBM. And they retired with IBM. You are all going to have a job. Every five years will be a different job. And the job difference is not just moving from Google to Facebook and doing the same thing. But it'll be maybe going from Google to General Motors, to an ad company, to Coca-Cola most importantly, that you probably will spin your own company by the age of 40. You will only do this if you are innovative, creative, adaptive, agile, team player, globally aware, think across disciplines, and be entrepreneurial. If you don't have any of these skill sets, you might be the best and the brightest A plus electrical engineer from Stanford, you may get the first best job that you'll be proud of, but you will probably not have a career which you will be proud of or be successful. Probably. I'm not saying that you won't be. Probably. The 21st century economy is an innovation economy. So you're all getting ready for the innovation economy. So I'm telling you, listen to your parents up to a point about your career choices. I tell my children that. I'll tell you a story of my daughter. So listen to your counselors up to a point. You are responsible for the career choices you make. You are responsible for the research that you do. You, of course, want to get information from as many people as you, ca as you can, and you should. But you should synthesize the information, analyze the information, and you should make decisions, because these skill sets are the most important skill sets that you can give to yourself. To the story of my daughter, if I have a few minutes. In grade eight, I asked my daughter, when she was in grade eight, eighth class, I asked my daughter, what do you want to do with your life? So she grew up in Arizona. So she said to me, Daddy, I want to be a film producer. I want to go to the Hollywood. I said, that's a fantastic profession, lovely. You should pursue that. Grade nine, I asked, what do you want to do with your life, Amrita? She said, well, Dad, I have changed. I think I attended a class in psychology, and I love psychology. I think I'm going to be a child psychologist. I said, that's a fantastic profession. You can help a lot of people. You should do it. Grade 10, I asked my daughter, what do you want to do with your life, Amrita? She said, Daddy, I met a nutritionist, nutritionist the other day. I enjoy what they do. They're able to do this cool stuff of figuring out how many calories and this and that and this. I think I want to be a nutritionist and help people. I said, that's a fantastic job, Amrita. You should do it. Grade 11, I asked her, what do you want to do with your life, Amrita? She said, Daddy, I want to be a nurse. The other day, I went to the hospital. Her mom, my wife, is a pediatrician. She said, I love what nurses are able to do and how they're able to help the patients. I want to be a nurse. I said, absolutely, fantastic profession. You can help a lot of people. You should do that. Grade 11, she came to me. Grade, grade, uh, grade 11, she's about to apply for universities. I asked her, so what do you want to do with your life, Amrita? She said, you know what, I took a course in economics with this teacher, and she is fantastic. I love macroeconomics and microeconomics. I really want to be an economist. I want to do an undergraduate degree in economics. I said, Amrita, that is fantastic. You should do economics. She said, but, but Barry, I also like uh, you know, um, uh, the um, physiology. I said, sure, why not physiology and economics? Do a double major. So she applied to certain universities for physiology and universities for economics. By the time she was about to accept these universities, she decided that she's going to do economics. And by the way, along the way, she took a course in biology in high school, and she hated it because her teacher didn't teach her well. One course. She came and told me that evening, I hate science. And I, it broke my heart. Not because she would not pursue science, but that one teacher can turn somebody's science spirit completely off. Again, I share this with you because never let that one teacher 
destroy your spirit in anything. So anyway, so she started economics. After the first year, her mom went to Haiti to help the relief victims and children in Haiti after the earthquake happened. So she said, Daddy, I would like to go with mom and also be with her. I said, sure, she should do it. So after the first year, she went in the summertime with her mom to Haiti, and she had an amazing experience in Haiti, working side by side with her mom, who was helping the kids, and she was doing dispensing medicines. She came back and she said, my God, Daddy, I saw that part of the world where people have hardly anything. This is really unbelievable what mom is able to do with those children. I want to go into medicine. I said, are you serious? You don't like biology? She said, no, I like medicine so much. I am going to take the pre-medicine courses and see how I, how I do well in those courses. I said, absolutely. She came back and two weeks later, she said, I want to go back to Haiti again by myself. She went again, did some more service work there, came back and made bags, for, uh, the handbags, I mean the school bags for the children, blankets for the kids. And then she put her heart and soul into going to medical school. There you do medical school after the undergraduate degree. So she did an undergraduate degree in economics with a pre-health minor and went to medical school. She's now in the medical school. The reason I share this story is not about my daughter. And one, one more thing I want to say. In grade 12, when I asked her, what do you want to do with your life? She said, Daddy, you asked me every year, what do you want me to do with my, my life? What do you want me to do with my life? She asked me back. I said, wow, finally. <laughs> finally, she has asked me what I wanted her to do with her life. I said, I want only one thing, Amrita. She said, what, Daddy? I want you to be happy all your life. It doesn't matter what you do. I want you to be happy all your life. She's in medical school now. The reason I share this is your experiences will change you. You have to be open to those. You have to be willing to try different things. This is the time in your life when you can do these amazing things. You are a generation that, are, that is capable of doing it. You are, you are the information age kids. So give yourself those opportunities. Don't just fall for the rote stuff. I have to go to engineering or medicine or this or that right away. You may choose as the first thing and you may stay with it, all fine. But make sure you collect all the experiences that you have. You can. And we wish you the very best in your career. Jerry. So I think that uh, in terms of experiences, we have a world that's building into being very much in cities. By the time you graduate, nearly 70% of all the world will live in cities. So much of what's gonna happen in the next 30 to 40 years is gonna have urban written around it. In fact, we're gonna build more cities in the next 30 years than ever been built in the world's history. And once we finish those cities, we'll live with what we build for the next two centuries. So if we build good cities, we could have a happy world. We build bad cities, polluting, crowded, unemployable, poverty, we'll have a sad and angry world for nearly two centuries. So you are the builders of cities in many ways, whether you're a nurse or an engineer or a lawyer, or a political scientist, any career. So here we have two universities, both in big cities. New York University in New York City, but also notice in Abu Dhabi and Shanghai and 14 other cities around the world where you can study. Prague, Paris, Buenos Aires, London. So think about where you're gonna be in terms of what you do when you're not in school. And more and more, think about being in a school that's engaged with a city. Arizona State, helping shape all of Phoenix and Tempe and the, the location it's in. So look at the location and ask, what will you get from the location? For a lot of our, for instance, NYU has no grass on its campus. There is no campus lawn because we're an urban university, it's city streets. You can not find any one building which is NYU's building because we're just all the buildings in a good bit of Manhattan. But what you get in return is all the city is your campus, it's your laboratory. So when you want to understand how poor people live and help them get out of poverty, they're there. If you want to understand how rich people buy goods and like marketing, you've got rich people to work with. 140 languages spoken in New York City. So you get a variety of ethnicity, culture, living of life. 
All of that leads to a much richer education. So not only ask yourself, what's the university do, but where does it take you? Where does it put you? And what will you learn from it? There's a good chance you may stay in that city where you get educated. So pick a city that you're going to love to live in, or you're going to make it part of your life. You're going to live in Delhi and also New York. All right, so an urban environment, a global environment, a learning to live with others, that's New York University. There are other places to go where, as Ponch says, you may see no one but someone like you, and that may be what you want. It's probably not why you would go internationally, because you can get that education right here. Yeah. So for what we bring is the chance to know the other, to know big cities, to know what the world's like, and to be part of the whole world. You have questions? Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, there is. Uh, some private universities, some public universities are as expensive as private universities. It turns out Berkeley is very expensive. My son goes there. Um, it's as expensive as a private university. But in general, public universities are relatively less expensive. So for example, an Arizona State University student would pay $20,000 a year, whereas a private university would be, Gary? Uh, NYU's tuition, 45000 a year. And then housing would be more. More, yeah. Same thing for housing. We're too. beginning to move at NYU towards international uh, financial aid so that uh, over the next few years, uh, you will see us more and more be a global university, and our financial aid will be distributed based on a global student body. But right now, it's more towards uh, American students are the first in line for financial aid, international students for some. There are more questions in the back. Yes, somebody raise their hand. Yeah. Get the mic on. Tell me a what shop? How many people? The belly shop. What? Oh, ballet club. Barrett, Barrett Honors College. Okay, I'm glad you asked the question. So. Um, some of these universities have honors colleges. The Barrett Honors College at Arizona State University is ranked okay. the top in the country. The students of the Barrett Honors College, Barrett is after Craig and Barbara Barrett. Craig Barrett was the CEO of Intel, and he uh, endowed this uh, Barrett Honors College. It's a fantastic honors college uh, inside the university. The quality of students there are similar to any of the Ivy League universities. And uh, the students from Barrett Honors College do exceedingly well in all aspects um, of, 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 of whatever you do after university. So it's, it's an outstanding honors college, ranked uh, one of the top in the country. Yeah. So I should also mention New York University has a new campus in Abu Dhabi, and this is a very unique campus. Uh, 150 students from around the world. Uh, we're graduating our first class this spring. Bill Clinton will give the graduation address. The uh, students admitted at this 150 students, as a rule, have SATs at about the 98% level, so almost perfect scores, often have two to three languages which they speak, and have led very interesting lives. Everything from being an impoverished young Ethiopian child who taught himself through the age 12 and then got admitted to school and went on to become one of our best students. But it's a fabulous global, 150 students, so it's an honors college in part of NYU, and it's a program which for most students is a scholarship program. That is, we will pay your way to attend this school. So if you feel you are really smart mm -hmm. and really innovative and ambitious to be part of 150 of the world's brightest students, look at Abu Dhabi's campus and apply. We'll fly you to Abu Dhabi for the interview exam, interview weekend, and you'll do that with another 70 students. It'll be a fabulous weekend, and you'll get a real feeling for uh, what it means to study in a global university. OK, one more question. Um, as a possible bio major, what would be the prerequisites for the, like, the application? What would make my application for in a way or stand out? Stand out. Uh, good question. You want Sorry. to read? Oh, sure. Um, what would make your application stand out? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that you can, I mean, in terms of your scores in SATs or ACTs, your 
your uh, performance, all of this is standard, right? So then now you're, now you're trying to make the case. Your personal statement is exceedingly important. What, what are you passionate about? Why do you want to go to an X university? Not because just you want to go to the United States, but why do you want to go to the United States? Why do you want to go to that university? Earlier, I think um, Bennett made the point, contextualize why that university? Because everybody is applying, everybody is good. It's a, it's a given. Therefore, you need to make the case, I want to go to this program in this university. Or I find that this university allows me to you know, try out in this program and go to some other program, whatever that might be. Do your research of the, pretend you're the university and then make your statement, reflect your passion, excitement, and why you're choosing that university. So I, I would agree with all of that, and I would add this. I'll tell you a little a story. I was counseling a young woman who wanted to come to New York University, and it was clear she really wanted to come, and I thought she was very bright. But she wrote in her application that NYU was her dream university. She didn't get admitted. And I think it was because she reflected a kind of just naive passion to be at NYU. She couldn't explain why it was her dream university. It was just her dream. She thought if she treated us well, we'd be so proud to have her. So the third piece of this is you need to show us that you're worth investing in. Because we actually view you someone we're investing in. We're helping you succeed. So the, you need to show this passion and show this ability to use what we're going to give you to help change the world. Now that takes some thought about what to do. Because in high school, you're just beginning that career. And yet we're expecting you to show as much of that as you can. So I would say good scores, active leadership in high school, involvement in the community, and then this passion, and finally, proof that you are an evidence that when we invest in you, it will return to the world's benefit, that you'll make a difference in the whole world. Excellent. Yes. Sure. Yep. So uh, NYU Stern School of Business uh, is ranked uh, eighth in the world in business schools. It's a great business school. It has a great undergraduate program. Uh, we more and more, are, our goal is to create someone who's good in business, good in organizations, who's good in innovation, who has an ambition to have an organization have impact on the world. So you hear a theme here, which is it's not enough just to sort of do a job, do a job that makes a difference, have an impact. So it's a uh, strong program with a large number of students, and it's very competitive. Jerry, are you planning to have it uh, campus in India now in Florida make that the loudest part of the <laughs> <laughs> So I think the, the short answer is probably no uh, for the next few years, because uh, as we, the question was, are we going to have a campus in India now that India's changed the laws. First, I, as I told the, uh, uh, the minister yesterday, it's easier to, for me to sell a jet to India than it is for me to sell an education to India. So the law is not as good as it looks. Uh, two is uh, because it, NYU is building a new campus in Shanghai and a new campus in Abu Dhabi, sort of the, the list is full. The reason I'm here in India, though, is to be sure when the time is right uh, we'll be first in line. So uh, I've argued to the uh, president of the university, we need to be in India, and at some point we will, but I think it'll be a few years. So for now, Shanghai, Abu Dhabi, or New York City. <laughs> <laughs>